The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of Kevin Jordan or his guests. These gardening tips and suggestions may work for you, as well as those from alternative sources. When using any garden products or tools, read and follow all label directions. And learn how to make your yard summer strong at BeWaterSmart.info. The Green Acres Garden Podcast is the podcast dedicated to helping gardeners hone their growing skills while we celebrate our love of plants. So whether you're new to growing or a seasoned gardener, you're sure to learn something new. Join the fun as we have conversations with world-class growers, passionate green thumbs, and professional garden experts from Green Acres Nursery and Supply. Listen every week. We'll answer questions you didn't know you had. And away we grow. Hey there, everyone. How's it going? And welcome to the show. So glad you could make it. Truly hope you're doing well. Welcome to the Green Acres Garden Podcast. My name is Kevin Jordan, a lover of plants and a lover of plant people. So if you're a plant person, uh, welcome home. Back in studio, we have an awesome, we have a family episode this week. It'll it'll be me and my brother, Austin. How's it going there, Austin? Hey, Kevin, I'm doing great. And welcome back to all of our listeners. Uh, You said it's a family show, is that what? Yep, we got a family episode. So uh, we are going to be just me and you in-house, but having a great talk uh, nonetheless. A wonderful episode to talk all about pollinators, uh, how we, the different types of pollinators, uh, how we can lure them in, different methods for basically maximizing our, our potential in our gardens to support them. Uh, really, we're talking about how to grow a pollinator buffet in your own garden. <laughs> so like we're going to have some fun, and I think people will be surprised. We talk a lot about, you know, bees and things like that, and we'll get into bees. We love them, but there's so much more when it comes right. to pollinators. So I love it. We're going to have a great episode. But before we get into it, I kind of want to share something with you, Austin. Let's go. Let's go. So I went on a little bit of a, an adventure yesterday. Yeah. I went up to the, the Big Tree State Park uh, out there Ooh, in Arnold, California. Yeah. Beautiful countryside. Out is the heart of the Sierras. Very cool. Uh, I got to see something cool, Austin. I did I, a thing. Okay. What did you do? I, I saw the world's most massive trees, <laughs> dude. And I loved it. I got to see the giant uh, sequoias. Uh, so it's massive. I mean, over so 300 feet there's tall. There's one there. It's got like a cool name, like Sergeant something. Is that is that the uh, one you? They're saw? all over California, and, but it's really cool though, and sad in a way. You'll see different ones that ha- do have different names, and the one that stuck with me the most was the Mother of the Forest. What what's that? It was a beautiful That's a tree. It, it was a tree. It was a beautiful, beautiful uh, giant sequoia. And gosh, I think in like uh, the early 1900s. Ooh, so it's like well over 100 feet. Oh, it's huge. No, yeah. it's over 300 feet. Oh, uh, but people God. came in and they they debarked it. What? They 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 stripped off that? the bark and kind Ow. of in huge sections. People worked on it to dig off the bark and strip it, and then they would take it around to like carnivals and fairs to show it off to oh. people because it's such a big tree. I mean, the diameter at the base is huge. So, okay. so, so these so aren't the tallest trees, but they are the most massive. That's a weird use. Yeah, and it ended up killing the tree. So all I saw oh, no. was like the living, or not even the, the dead skeleton, the remains, but they're still kind of vertical, semi burnt. It was sad. But the rest of the trees there, I don't want to get in and get it all <laughs> negative. Let's get positive. Uh, the Big Tree State Park was phenomenal. Uh, yeah. And it, you, you go on this little mile and a half long hike. It's very easy. I, I suggest it to anybody if, if you can, if you're mobile, do it. Uh, it was beautiful. And there's I mean, a couple dozen of the most massive, uh, actually, the, not, not just the most massive trees, the most massive living things on the planet. So single, cool. like the, Yeah, so as, as a single organism, it doesn't get any bigger than these. That's they are the right largest. right here in our backyard. For I sure. I love that. And I've been there a couple times, and I, I love being out there. It's beautiful. You're right. Uh, those, they're very impressive, those trees. It was really, yeah, it was awesome to see. When I was out there, actually, I started noticing they had a lot of native plants out there, and they had some plantings. I saw some native creatures buzzing around, and it got me thinking, we got to talk about pollinators. All right, let's talk pollinators. So pollinators, um, they're those creatures, the organisms that visit our our flowers for food. Sometimes they'll even go there for mates, shelter, nest building materials, what have you. Uh, These can be, like I said, not just bees, but ants, bats, beetles, birds, butterflies, flies, moths, uh, wasps. And in some regions of the world, not so much our backyard, but in some regions of the world, you'll even get mammals like lemurs, uh, oh. honey possums, or, or reptiles like lizards and geckos and skinks that can be pollinators. So I was wow. doing research. There's a skink that crawls up into a blossom of a tree in the jungle. And as that tree grows and develops nectar, the skinks, they slurp out the nectar 
Uh, and that just them kind of crawling around and slithering and then just oh, moves the pollen around. Oh, they're just doing what a bee would do. Absolutely. Whoa, that's and pretty so cool. And so it's pretty sweet. Um, we could even get in, uh, into a little bit of uh, the night pollination game. Okay. Because uh, we've, we've brought up moon gardens here before. Uh, I think we should talk about it because I love moon gardens. They're, they're, they're really interesting to think about when you're like, oh, like with this garden, everything's white and right. kind of uh, unique looking. And so... That's all about those night pollinators. Uh, so that's something to think about. Those moths. We love our moths when they're not planting Can or I ask you laying a question? their eggs. Oh yeah, please. So, so I think you said pollinators are all these creatures. I think that answers my question, which was what what is a pollinizer? Because sometimes we talk about attracting pollinators, and then pollinizers get thrown in there too. But that's something different. That's a great question thing to bring up. Actually, we've, we've talked about this in the past, especially when we uh, all of our fruit tree discussion about planting bare roots and whatnot. It's it's important to Realize if you're planting certain trees and if you want to get a good harvest, some of them require a pollinizer so that way those trees can be pollinated. Oh, so it's another tree. So it's another tree that ha- is compatible. So you'll see this with apples a lot, uh, avocados, um, cherries a bunch, uh, and so on. And a tree will grow, and it's if it's not self-pollinating on the tag, it'll say requires a pollinizer. And then usually you'll get a list of um, some good options to start with. Uh, yeah, so, so pollinator and pollinizer – Different things, but same game. Gotcha. It's all about, you know, getting that fruit. Spreading the love. Absolutely. Dude, <laughs> you said it, buddy. Your word's not mine. All right, so we definitely want to attract pollinators, and that's something we can do based on what we plant, right? But f- before we even get into that, you already listed out some cool creatures that yeah. do pollinate, and I'd never heard of m- mammals doing it. That's super cool. But you said ants? Yeah, absolutely. Even ants do it. There's a, a lot of flowers that are specifically ant pollinated, and no that's way. that's just the way they get down. And uh, the flower, it's just coevolution. These creatures uh, and these plants have spent you know hundreds of thousands, millions of years, uh, kind of working and living simultaneously, you know, cohabitating in the same space, and it's they've kind of worked themselves into a nice little niche. And so, uh, absolutely, you'll see ants all the time. Uh, pollinating specific plants hmm. um that's it's pretty rad i'll see this a little bit on some of my even my um dragon fruit i'll see some some ants oh. going in there so it's it's kind of fun to see that usually you know you in the garden you go oh ants bad yeah maybe maybe not maybe not it really depends on where they're at and what they're doing for me pollinators uh we have they do so much for us so first off around 80 percent of the 1400 crop plants grown around the globe for food that we eat and material that we use for our clothing and whatnot, 80% of all those, those crops require some form of animal um, pollination. And so that's pretty, pretty interesting to think about. And not only that, is we're kind of, I always, you know, we're kind of human centric uh, when we think about our gardens and our, what we're producing. Yeah. But what's really cool is that Many other organisms, uh, both plant and an, uh, animal, will benefit from pollinators. Oh, cool. So we talk about, yeah, oh, it's great for us, our food, and blah, blah. It's really awesome just for everything. And so it, it, pollinators, when they're healthy and their numbers are on the rise and not in decline, um, like in some cases they are, which is not great. So we want those, got to get those numbers up, bud. And so when those when pollinators are have healthy you know, numbers, it's good for everybody. It's like a rising tide lifts all boats. So it's not just us cool. in our own gardens and our own, you know, getting our own crops in. Uh, it's just everything gets to benefit. And so this, that's what we're going to kind of celebrate on today's episode. I love that. That's great to hear. Because, uh, yeah, I've been told many times, you know, one out of three bites of food that we eat is, you know, because of a pollinator. But uh, what about all the other creatures that benefit from it, too? That's a great perspective. I love it. I'm so down to attract more pollinators to our yards. Uh, so what are some of the methods? What, how are we going to do this? What should we do, Kevin? Well, we're going to do that by looking through the eyes of our pollinators. Okay, oh, so we okay. want to s- kind of s- view the garden, how they might view it. So, for instance... Uh, they have some wacky eyes, though, some of them. So they <laughs> do. Uh, speaking of which, do you know some beetles' research has shown that beetles may be capable of color vision? I did not know which that. Which is pretty cool. So, uh, not to, you know, toot my own horn, but <laughs> beetles are really interesting. They, are, they were among some of the first insects ever to visit flowers. Uh-huh. Um, so, some plants that we may notice, like magnolias, mm-hmm. are, are beetle pollinated. Sometimes uh, beetles, they'll eat their way through the petals because they have a very strong sense of smell. And, they're, uh, and they're, they use that color vision. And so, there's certain kind of characteristics of, of beetle flowers. Usually, they're bowl-shaped. They're, they could be white, dull white, or green. And usually they're, they're open during the day. But beetles 
they are an important pollinator. So just something okay. to something to kind of not, yeah. We know. don't we don't really mention beetles that much. No, so I it's mean, good to give them a little love. The beetles, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, sorry. No, we talk about the plenty. But it really, uh, I think it's going to depend on the, the kind of pollinators you want to bring in. And so, from a large scale, just looking down, color and fragrance is going to be is going to be huge. So white flowers that bloom, those are going to be you know night bloomers, things like that. Those are going to be uh, wonderful plants to lure in all your, your night pollinators. So, for instance, um, maybe like moonflower, angel's trumpet, night-blooming jasmine, um, f- ones that are white with a strong fragrance. That's like gardenia. You'll get l- listeria or <laughs> listeria, wisteria. Um, you can get lilacs and lilies often are also good f- for those night bloomers. But it, it really uh, because they're going to be popping and blooming either fragrant or colorful at night. So uh, the ones that are fragrant and colorful during the day are going to attract different types of pollinators. So depending cool. upon what you plant, it's really going to uh, affect what you lure into your yard. So it's kind of fun. That buffet can be one that a gardener creates um, very specifically for what they, they hope to kind of lure in. And it's really up to, up to where you're at and what you, where you live and so what you want to see. So maybe you want to bring the moths in at night. That's cool. I think that reminds me of... It must have been Stephanie Bittner was talking about flowers are fragrant at different times of the day and therefore yep. attract different insects. That's so cool. And I, I'm curious, though, if um, so I just let some of my basil bolt and it's blooming. Oh, yeah. Beautiful white flowers. It was recently mentioned. I forget when that that would be a good thing to it's attract amazing bees. One. It's on my list right now. Oh, today. is it? it OK, w- yes, so, sir. so I'm doing that right now. Yeah, I got my basil going. It's fun. Yeah, I always leave a little bit of basil and just let it bolt, and then just yep. as long as I have enough to kind of keep cutting and eating. Yeah, but, I've uh, got two plants, so one's it, doing that, and the other they one. love them. They're, those spikes come up. Like you said those little white flowers, yep. uh, and the bees just go wild for them. So that that's a great example. But do you of think it. that would attract moths too at night? They're you know they are white at night. That, that's a good point. I don't know, but I they bees definitely love them. I'll have to set up a like an infrared camera. You, you, well, yeah, check that would night. be sweet. Well, you know, there's actually flowers that actually glow a little bit at night. No you way. Know? So what? like white cosmos, zinnia, yarrow, those are ones that are listed for that. Ones that are just extra can be popping a little bit brighter at night mm. and to help um, kind of provide for those those nighttime pollinators. Bats are can be nighttime pollinators, and they actually are amazing pollinators. There, there's incredible videos of them you know flying through the desert looking for cactus flower cacti uh, cactus blossoms they put their little furry face in there and they get it all covered full of nectar and pollen <laughs> and then they come back a few weeks later all those flowers they pollinated they're now fruit and then they oh. just eat that they eat the fruit now the now the seeds are in their belly they fly across the desert excreting the seeds with their 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 guano their fertilizer it's per, it's like nature it's almost is, like they know what they're doing it's pretty cool <laughs> right and so uh so it's not just the bees we uh, bats are incredible bats pollinators as well and they they love that nighttime I forget about bats yeah <laughs> for <laughs> sure out there though oh yeah you know it um one thing I wanted to bring up, though, is like you, you brought up uh, basil. Yeah. Other plants, if people just want a nice list of plants just to give them some ideas. Um, and the uh, basil, bee balm, cilantro, coreopsis, cosmos, dill, echinacea, goldenrod, lemon balm, marigolds, milkweed, mountain mint, parsley, sunflowers, veronicas, yarrow, zinnias, just to name a few. Woo. Right? A to Z almost there. Wow. Uh, and that's just a few, right? And that's just the base. Those, those are the bee-friendly ones, a lot of those. But um, there's some there's some great options out there. Other things you can do to kind of really lure them in, uh, like I said, is the fragrance and the colors. But really, how you plant them can be helpful as well. They, it can be really nice if you kind of bunch plants together a little bit to, uh, instead of just having them all completely sparsed out. If you create little little these little oases or little, mm. it becomes like a refuge, and you want that refuge to be a proper buffet. We don't want it to be a little you know a little sampling little finger food for these creatures. We want them to have a lot of food. I like that. I don't know if we've really gone over that point. That seems like a really good point. Like, of course, you don't want just a little bit here and then spread out far away another thing, right? You want to group them up. It helps. That makes total sense. It helps. And then just planting a variety of flowers uh, with flower shapes. Uh, This allows more bee species to to feed amongst your garden. Um, There's over 1,600 different bee species just in California alone. Wow, and that's not referring to the ones we we loved on the few weeks ago with the with the honeybee, right? With, uh, Tim, the beekeeper. Yeah, these are native bees. Over a thousand different species just in our state alone. That's and so, incredible. when you plant, start planting a you know a nice swath, a good variety of different plants with different colors, different flower shapes, 
you're really going to offer up um, just more opportunity for different species to maybe take advantage of, of your garden in a way that you maybe didn't have before. So that's so a lot of flowers, a lot of different types of flowers. And consider when they bloom. Um, we, we talked about this quite a bit when, with our interview with Joe, Joe Gar- Garden Joe, Gardener yep. Joe. Joe Lample. Joe Lample. Man, he was great. And he kind of discussed, yeah, it's like planting spring blooming bulbs and then having natives and then having summer bloomers and fall, you know, plants that just continually provide interest, um, but also just support the native wildlife. Um, It was a great, great conversation. It kind of stuck with me and it still works in today's episode. Yeah. So, yeah. So consider the seasons of when the plants, the flowers, when they do bloom. Some things bloom right at the beginning, you know, right at the end of winter, early spring, then you'll get mid spring, late spring bloomers, you know, it goes through this go through the summer. So just even there's fall bloomers as well. Um, so just considering what you're going to plant and when they will actually be blooming, it's kind of cool because then you create this ongoing buffet. You don't want it just right. to be one and done and just good for a month. And then, you know, then show's over. You don't got to go, <laughs> you don't got to go home, but you can't stay here. Uh, you, you want them to stay here. We want to be able to go out in our gardens um, and just enjoy these creatures. One of the first things I really enjoyed when I kind of dipped my toe into horticulture, landscaping, and working in um, nurseries, it's just I was just watering plants and just watching the pollinators, the hummingbirds. Uh, they're incredible pollinators as well. But just the bees and all these different creatures in the nurseries that I never really noticed before or mm-hmm. saw in my own home or garden because we didn't really have a lot of flowers and plants at home, at least not in not in the numbers I would have liked. <laughs> and so at the nursery, it's all concentrated. Right. And so you see these massive... This big old plump, thick thighed carpenter bees Ooh. coming through, like, hey there. Hey, girl. <laughs> uh, and it's just great. It's incredible. And you see these creatures you, you never really noticed before. And it just gets you excited about the world. I see so many bugs now out in my garden, things I didn't even know exist, spiders that I didn't realize could look that way. And, you know, just the other day, I saw like some weird stuff going on with a wasp and a caterpillar. There was like, <laughs> it murdered the caterpillar. I don't know why, but. I assume that, yeah, that wasp is probably out there pollinating too, right? I there mean, are actually, um, wasps are on the list. They are? There are some um, wasps that do pollinate. Well, that was like a rude sure. wasp, but, but maybe he's still doing good Some of the them are, are a little bit meaner than <laughs> others, for sure. Uh, they're sassy. Yeah. But it's so funny. Yeah, you see these, these relationships between these, uh, these organisms, and then we're kind of, just, you know, we're a thousand miles above, right. kind of look, looking down. It's, we want to do all we can. We want to create a little refuge if your own little garden can just be it's an, an oasis for, for these creatures, it's kind of fun. Um, if you want to support pollinators, uh, they need water, especially in our summer months. And so there's a few few easy things that you can do to kind of support these uh, native creatures that maybe do need some some uh, some agua. Okay. So you can add pebbles or floating corks to your bird bath, so that way the bees can have plenty of places to stand. They'll, they'll, they'll land. Uh, and be on near a, the water. Oh, be like on and a And then cork. they can sip it. Yeah. So something that either it could be rocks, a floating cork, just something that kind of is in the water that allows them to get gain access So and uh, to your bird baths. Uh, so that way they can take a sip without falling in. It's a bummer. You ever seen a bee fall into the water? I've seen that, yeah. Like in a pool. Yeah. Right? And I would try It's fun to, saving them. Yeah. Yeah. You go, oh, a little karma build. Splash um, them out. You're like, I did that. But uh, it, yeah, so then you can use a hummingbird feeder and fill it with plain water instead of sugar water. Uh, that can be something that'd be helpful. You can fill a shallow container, such as a saucer, with water. You can add pebbles or marbles to the bottom for the bees to stand on, so you can make your own. Uh, they call it a pebble tray or whatnot. And uh, or you know, some people even get uh, creative with like a self-filling pet bowl, and then do the same thing. Throw a couple, oh, there we go. couple little cobbles in the bottom, and then just kind of fills up to a certain height, and uh, bing, bang, boom, you're you're good to go. So it's you never really think about it. We're we're very uh, blossom centric, but even just a simple thing as adding a little bit of water out in the garden um, can be helpful. We talk about in the fall and the winter about not cleaning up too much mm, because right. there's a lot of these species. It's really interesting. They will they will overwinter uh, in like the the leaf litter. And- I know the beetles really seem to like that kind of stuff. When I've got like loose stuff in the yard, or I pick up a brick, or you know. There's always, like, seems to be like, beetles. Hey, I'm under here. Yeah, there's <laughs> yeah. always some little beetle down there. Oh, yeah. Ooh, here's an interesting fact, Austin. This is a night pollinator creature that you probably wouldn't think is a pollinator, and you would probably think it's a fly. Okay. But check this out. So the luminescent firefly, they're actually beetles, not flies. Okay. But a good firefly is really interesting. They have a longer lifespan than most insects, and they actually will spend several months underground just in the leaf debris of a forest, just kind of hanging out, waiting until it's nice and warm, and then, oh, summertime, time to go mate, 
And cool. so it's pretty interesting. And those are that's a night pollinator See, as well. That's what I'm saying. Such a beetle move. Yeah, very beetle. <laughs> What's in beetles are nuts. One quarter, so about 25% of all the creatures on the planet are a beetle. No way. That's <laughs> how many beetles there are, how many different species of beetles. So out of all the species on the planet, a quarter of them are beetles. Oh my goodness. So they're they're very diverse uh, and Where they're widespread. They <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, they're, you ever seen the dung beetles? They're they're oh, ha- ha- hard at work. Oh boy. So they're good and they are wonderful pollinators. So we definitely want to take care of our beetles. Okay. Well, I love those beetles. So Kevin, I don't know if we've mentioned birds yet. I know we always want to attract um, the insects, the bees, the butterflies, those are the big ones. But uh, sometimes we talk about hummingbirds too. So how do we attract the the birds? I love birds. Uh, I'd rather have them in my garden. Garden, uh, nibbling my flowers, I guess, than my fruit. So uh, yeah, give, them, give them a buffet. Uh, there's over 2,000 bird species globally that feed on nectar or the insects and the spiders associated uh, with nectar bearing flowers. So there's a lot of different birds across the globe that actually can be considered a pollinator. Um, they're very important for us. Here we have hummingbirds. If you go out to Hawaii, you're going to get the honey creepers and honey eaters all the way down in Australia. Those are also important pollinators for those regions. So birds, they, they make up a good, a good section of pollinators. And so for bird flowers, if you're looking just in general, um, just for um, characteristics or morphology uh, that maybe kind of will go, ooh, maybe, maybe a bird might like that. Here's it is. There's tubular. They might have tubular uh, petals that are like kind of curved and out of the way. Uh, it might be funnel shaped or cups. Usually they'll have strong supports for perching. So a little branching there. Uh, oftentimes you'll see the flowers are going to be brightly colored. A lot of reds, a lot of yellows and oranges, whereas the bees, um, they like some of that, but they're also really into like the blues and the purples and the lavenders. Mm. Uh, birds are also bright, uh, really into like the odorless. They don't really need, they don't, they have a poor sense of smell. So fragrance really isn't going to do a whole lot for them. So whereas the insects, uh, are like, woo, oh yeah. Uh, Interesting. Birds also like, they're typically into, um, flowers that are usually open during the daytime. So day, day bloomers. And they they can be um, the prolific nectar producers. Uh, they are prolific nectar producers with nectar that's deeply hidden. So when they if they can get in there, if it's difficult for other creatures, sometimes they have a a, a better chance. Wow, it's so cool to in- and interesting to hear about <laughs> the different ways these flowers are doing their business to attract different things. Like so, the shapes of flowers are part of it. The perchability, the colors too. It's this is fascinating. Yeah, and you brought up hummingbirds. They're a huge chunk of it. I love them out in the garden. Personally, uh, the salvia are just incredible uh, lures for the, like a magnet for hummingbirds. But uh, the red hot poker, Nifofia, spelled with a K, um, hardy plant, rugged. The leaves aren't much to look at, but man, those flowers are killer. It looks like almost like an ornamental grass until it blooms, and you're like, whoa, that's like a super ornamental grass. And then the hummingbirds just come down, and that plant doesn't get very tall. So that way, when the hummingbirds do come down, you're sitting on your patio, they're at eye level, man. It's it's so cool. So there are some plants out there that you can truly, if you just plant them. For me, they're better than a hummingbird feeder. Like mm. a, a good feeder's cool. You'll see that, and then you get a good view. You fill it up, clean it, whatever. I'm into that as well. But I'm telling you, if if you if you want a sustainable approach to luring in hummingbirds. Just pl- plant those salvia, plant the sage, plant the nifofia. And there's there's a few more other varieties out there that I think you can have fun with for hummingbirds. Cool. I actually have a list of some other varieties. So, oh, yeah? So there's this link. I'll put it in the uh, episode description. It'll take you to nice. uh, this article from Green Acres called Grow a Pollinator Buffet. And in there, there's some cool, really you know, beautiful pictures and factoids. But then there's uh, some lists of plant favorites for all these different categories of pollinators. So if you're looking to attract... Specifically, hummingbird. Uh, the what is it? Nymphophia. 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 Or there's all these other options available that they list out, and then there's a list for attracting bees, and then there's a list for attracting butterflies as well. So uh, whatever you're looking for, check that out. Oh, that's a good resource. Yeah, for sure. I love it. Yeah, I hope uh, our listeners feel inspired to attract some pollinators. Get out there, maybe find some plants that they don't have, or uh, get some more that are working. Whatever you doing out there, I hope we're um, you know just being mindful of all those those creatures and critters out there that are doing their amazing work. Absolutely, they are doing some amazing work, and a lot of it just goes unseen. And so, what, if we can do anything to support them, I'm, I'm all for it. And there are some plants out there. That, like I said, they are like magnets. They they produce so much for these plants. The nectar and you know that pollen getting stuck to them. It's just it's like nature doing its thing. Uh, What's like the nectariest plant 
that you think? Oh, of? that's a great question. Um, ooh, one like dripping with well, nectar. one that I, I mean, personally, honeysuckle. Um, oh. and hum, you know, hummingbirds and you know, are all about that I too. But uh, for me, I go on walks and I'll kind of kind of pull little pieces you can off smell and it. just yeah. suck that nectar right out. Uh, <laughs> and so that's one that I kind of have a good relationship with. Okay. But another one's kind of interesting too. I don't know if it's nectar, but uh, just the the pitcher plant where it's a carnivorous plant, uh-huh. where it's not nectar, but it has, has digestive juices. Oh God! So there's some fun, yeah. There plant liquids. It's it could be a whole <laughs> other topic. Uh, but no, there, there's some incredible. I mean, if you want to taste some nectar, go out and taste some honey, and there you're we really going to get a taste of some flowers. Uh, so I, we love it. We love these creatures, and if we can do anything to kind of create, like I said, a little oasis, a refuge. Um, no matter how big or small, um, I think we can do we can do our part. It's kind of fun. We want these numbers on the rise. And if anything, it's just kind of fun to be out there, maybe a little cup of iced tea or whatever, and just sit quietly and watch these creatures just come in and do their thing and and help us out all the while. So it's pretty cool. I love it. And it's really it comes down to just planting as many different flowers as you can that you know have a relationship w- with a pollinator. Um, different colors uh, and different fragrances and when they bloom, whether during the day or at night or in the spring or in summer and fall, these are all considerations. So it's kind of fun. It's like a recipe that a gardener at home can create themselves so that way they can maybe have a little, it's it's all experimenting. It's kind of, Mm -hmm. that's what's fun about gardening is every garden is unique. Every person is a little bit different. And what kind of, what they create is a kind of a special little situation, a little moment in time. So let's feed these creatures while we have some time. That is a beautiful message, Kevin. I love that so much. Uh, why don't you go ahead and take us out this week? Well, it was an amazing week uh, being on vacation. I hope our listeners are having fun, whether they're at work or on vacation as well. Um, life short. Live it up. Plant hard. Garden well. Love every moment of it if you can. Until next week, garden friends, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Austin, for another great edit. you the man, dude. I appreciate all that you do here. And to all of our listeners, please keep coming back for more. Share us with a friend, and we'll see you next week. Happy gardening to you all, and please never stop growing.